Well, the saturated fat uh, story has been uh, very prevalent in the media uh, lately because it's really been the cornerstone of our dietary guidelines in the sense that we've advocated for lowering saturated fat and been telling people for almost four decades now to reduce the saturated fat in their diet with the um, intention to reduce risk for obesity and diabetes and heart disease. However, recent evidence has clearly indicated that there's no association between dietary saturated fat and risk for heart disease or diabetes. And so we're rethinking this whole paradigm around saturated fat. And we've done some of the seminal work in our laboratory that has linked the effects of saturated fat to the amount of carbohydrate in your diet. And what's really important to understand is it's not so much the dietary saturated fat that we need to be concerned with. It's whether or not you're accumulating saturated fat in your body, in your membranes, and in your arteries. Because if you do, that is associated with risk for heart disease. And it turns out dietary saturated fat has little to do with how much saturated fat we store. It's actually the carbohydrate in our diet that's contributing to synthesis of saturated fat in the body as well as storage and, and accumulation of saturated fat. So if you overconsume carbs, then you put your body into a metabolic state where you're more likely to store the saturated fat. So it's really a story more about carbohydrate than it is about saturated fat in the diet. Hunger uh, is often a result of decreased energy supply to the brain. And the brain is a very energetically expensive organ. It burns about 600 kcals per day just being a brain. And that primarily comes from glucose or sugar. And if the brain has any interruption in that supply of sugar to the brain, uh, it signals you to want to eat in particular, eat carbohydrate and sugar. And so when people go on a low-calorie, low-fat diet, they often don't have enough carbohydrate uh, coming in the diet to feed their brain. And that's why they, that low-fat, low-calorie diets tend to fail long-term, despite even heroic amounts of willpower. An alternative approach is if you restrict calories but also restrict carbohydrate, the brain can adapt to using molecules called ketones, which accumulate on a low-carbohydrate, low-calorie diet. And in that case, you can restrict calories, but the brain is actually well-fed because ketones are circulating at a very stable and sustainable level uh, to feed the brain. So for many people, restricting calories is better achieved by restricting carbohydrates rather than restricting fat because it feeds the brain. The term that I prefer to use uh, is a well-formulated low-carbohydrate diet as opposed to, uh, in practice, what amounts to a, a casual approach to restricting carbohydrates. And what I mean by that is it, it requires more than just simply limiting potatoes and, and sugar in your diet and other starches. Um, it, act, it actually, you need to understand how to manipulate the fat quality, the uh, protein level in the diet, as well as paying attention to minerals and, and vitamins uh, in terms of optimizing those uh, nutrients as well. And so a whole science behind how to go about formulating a low-carbohydrate diet so that it optimizes health and, most important, that it's sustainable long-term. The main adaptation to a low-carbohydrate diet is that your body switches from relying on carbohydrate from, for fuel to using fat for fuel. And that has a lot of advantages associated with it. You sort of relieve yourself from this dependency on carbohydrate and instead train your cells in your body to use your own body fat for fuel and to also burn fat that you're eating. And this cellular switch to fat for fuel makes it easier to lose weight, makes it easier to manage many uh, chronic health conditions like prediabetes and diabetes and perhaps even heart disease and cancer as well. Uh, but fundamentally that's what's happening. Your cells are switching their fuel source over uh, 
from carbs to fat. For the last 40 years, we've been telling athletes that you need to consume high carbohydrate diets and carbohydrate load before events in order to optimize performance. And interestingly, we're rethinking that entire paradigm now too because a, a wide uh, range of athletes are switching from a high carbohydrate diet, essentially abandoning the carbohydrate loading approach and instead adopting a very low carbohydrate, high fat, moderate protein diet. And these athletes are not just you know, finishing races. In many cases, they're actually winning and in some cases setting course records. So in some ways, we're almost rewriting um, textbooks in terms of what we're learning about fuel metabolism in high-level athletes and what their capabilities can be if they adapt to a low-carbohydrate diet. For individuals interested in, in adopting a, a low-carbohydrate lifestyle, uh, you know, there, there, there is wide variability between people and how they respond to a low-carbohydrate diet and what level of carbohydrate restriction would be appropriate for them. But a good place to start is to actually measure your ketone levels, which is possible uh, at this point in time with, um, with a finger stick and using a typical glucometer that is adapted to measuring ketones instead of glucose. And so you have a, a, an immediate result, if you will, in terms of how your body's responding to the current level of carbohydrate you're, you're consuming. On average, for most people, to be in a state of ketosis requires consuming less than approximately 50 grams per day. But if you're relatively healthy and exercising, uh, that number may be closer to 70 or 80 grams per day. If you happen to be a type 2 diabetic or someone who's profoundly insulin resistant, that number may be lower at 35 or even 30 grams per day. So there's no real way to know unless you actually measure the result and that gives you some feedback in order to adjust your carbohydrate intake. So it turns out that type two diabetics who are the most carbohydrate intolerant respond the most favorably to a, a well-formulated ketogenic diet. And it doesn't just prevent the disease um, in, in many existing type 2 diabetics, you can put their disease into remission. I don't like to use the term cure because you may not have cured their insulin resistance, but by measuring any signs or symptoms of diabetes, they would essentially not have the disease. So it's a very, very powerful tool uh, for managing and even reversing type 2 diabetes.